Hello, everybody. This is the Doctor. Welcome back to Star Trek Online Delta Rising News. This is September 19th, 2014. It has been a couple of weeks since my last news update for Star Trek Online. I apologize for the lengthy wait in time. Uh, I've had quite a bit of uh, work to do the last couple of weeks. I was out of town for several days on a business trip and uh, just haven't been able to get to the Star Trek news until now. And it has been a couple of weeks and there have been a ton of of news updates for Star Trek Online Delta Rising. Just a lot of stuff to go through. I've got all my tabs lined up at the top, as you can see here. I have not read any of this myself. So this is a blind look myself at what is coming, some of the new stuff that's been announced in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading all this. I kind of just glanced over what I'm going to be looking at, but I haven't read about them yet, so... Uh, right here, announcing the Dauntless. I'm excited for that. Can't wait to read that tab. Anyway, this is going to be a lot of reading, a lot of audio, not much fun, except uh, just sit back, I guess, and enjoy my voice, hopefully, maybe. Um, I will, uh, of course, show each tab. I'll zoom in so you can read along as well. And, uh, yeah, I'm going to try to get through this. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine tabs to talk about here. And uh, I want to get through all of them. I want to read all of them. And, uh, and then we'll talk about uh, some of the new stuff here at the end. So um, here we go. Let's jump into it and get it going because this, this can take a while. But I'm going to try to, like I said, get through this pretty quickly. All right. So there's a new adventure zone. We know there's going to be new adventure zones. One of them is called the Kobali Adventure. If you have not seen the Kobali, uh, it is a Star Trek Voyager episode, and I forget the name of the episode. Um, I believe it's the one where the they um, after they die, they are transported to some kind of like planetoid or an asteroid or something like that, and they actually evolve into another kind of alien creature or something and i believe it was it was either harry kim or tom paris who um met the Kabali. they ended up actually um coming back to life or something in their culture it was i, I vaguely remember all the details of the episode but i do recommend watching it if you've never seen it just to remind yourself who the Kabali are i'm sure somebody in comments will fill in on the episode name all right the Kobali are under attack. The only thing standing between them and total annihilation is the Alpha Quadrant Alliance. Can you save the Kobali and discover the mysteries of their homeworld? The Kobali Adventure Zone is a persistent adventure zone for players starting at level 54. Players will be able to bring two of their bridge officers to the surface, and play players can team together without losing their bridge officers. We've taken the scalability and team-friendly elements of our battle zones and combined them with a fleshed-out personal storyline to give players content unlike anything they've seen in Stowe. All right, first of all, I like the idea that we're getting two bridge officers we get to keep on our uh, team this time. I mean, there's a reason why there are ground bridge officers in this game. You build your ground bridge officers, you know, for your character, and you want them with you on these missions. So I'm, I hope that they continue this trend of allowing us to use our bridge officers in PvE content like this, um, because we've got them for a reason, we, and, and we want to use them. Uh, so I like that fact. There are several regions within the zone. The forward base is the Kobali City, where the civilians have been evacuated, and the makeshift Kobali military has set up their last line of defense. The countryside outside of the city is dotted with the homes of the Kobali that prefer to live in more pastoral surrounds. Now these homes serve merely as cover between the Kobali and the um, assailants. I guess what they've done is they've had to create this whole Kobali background because none of this was in Star Trek Voyager. This is all brand new. This is cryptic created right here. So I guess they had to really, you know, develop this from scratch. So this is a cryptic developed kind of background on the Kobali. Further north, the land has been dug up and turned into trenches where enemy troops gather their main forces to continue their relentless assault upon the Kobali people. The presence of these trenches baffles Starfleet intelligence. The enemy's goal was to conquer the Kobali. Why go through all the trouble of trench warfare when there are other ways for these forces to assault the Kobali from the sky? 
To the east of the mountains, once a place where the Kabali would take leisure hikes and sleep beneath the stars, none of the Kabali dare go there through the mountain pass for now. For fear of what awaits them, many Kabali scouts have been sent to investigate what is happening in the mountains, but none have returned. Some of the Kabali reports indicate that the enemy has set up an entire base on the mountaintop. So a mystery on the mountaintop to uh, explore. Players will be able to experience the story of the Kabali through several missions that take place in the persistent world. In between these stories, players can participate in the open missions that are constantly taking place in the zone. These open missions are set up on scale for the number of players in the area. This means that open missions can be completed alone or with a team just like our battle zone content. However, we have added a twist to these open missions. Each one has an escalation phase that can be triggered by a team or extremely skilled solo players. The phase will offer a further challenge and more rewards and will also scale based on the number of players on the map. We're excited for all of you to experience the Kabali Adventure Zone. We encourage those who want to help refine it to log on to Tribble and give your feedback. So apparently this is on Tribble right now. Um, so um, right off the bat, there are some mysteries. It sounds to me like the Defera Battle Zone. Um, I believe it's Defera. And um, also the, what am I thinking, a little, a little bit of New Romulus going on here. Uh, and then a little bit of the Voth battle zone, kind of all those elements put together into one battle zone is what I'm thinking about this. So, first of all, I don't know if the Kabali are that interesting of an alien, all right? I mean, when you got new Romulus, that's interesting because it's Romulans. You know, you got the Farah, eh, who, who, who really knew about the Defari before the Farah? But that's become kind of interesting. Um, the Voth obviously are an interesting alien. I don't know about the Kabali. I mean, they just don't seem interesting to me. And from the only one episode we saw him in Star Trek Voyager, it did not seem like an alien you could really build upon, whereas the Voth was something you could build upon, also seen in only one episode of Voyager. The Kabali just didn't seem like an alien that I wanted to see more of, but apparently we're going to see more of it in Star Trek Online anyway. So um, that'll be a new Adventure Zone to check out. I will have to give that a try. Okay, let's move on to the next thing. What do we got here? This is Delta Alliance Reputation. So obviously they're going to have a new reputation. We've already got like five or six of them. What do we have? We have the Undine 18472, so that's one. We've got um, the, um, uh, the the Voth one, the Dyson stuff, that's two. We got Nukara, that's three. We got Romulan, that's four. We got Omega, that's five. So we have five reputations right now. And it uh, uh, looks like we're going to have a sixth one added here. Everybody expected that. I mean, that's just kind of seems like that would be the normal thing for them to do. The Delta Alliance. All right. After USS Voyager returned from the Delta Quadrant in 2378, Starfleet launched Project Voyager, a program to analyze the technology and, and data the ship collected during the seven-year journey and adapt it for use on all Starfleet vessels. Now that the gateway to Delta Quadrant has been opened and a joint alliance will be exploring the region, the SCE is sharing its research with counterparts from the Klingon Defense Force and Romulan Republic Militia to help equip all ships taking part in Operation Delta Rising for the challenges they will face in the Delta Quadrant. At the launch of Delta Rising, the Federation Klingons and Romulans, uh, at or above level 50, will be able to prove their worth by helping the Delta Alliance. Earning progress in the Delta Alliance will grant these elite captains access to equipment and abilities uh, intended to assist in the effort to explore the Delta Quadrant. Increasing your standing with the Delta Alliance will require the submission of Delta Marks, obviously. I, and I, I kind of like that term, Delta Marks. Sounds uh, normal, kind of rolls right off the tongue. These can be earned by completing repeatable queued events from Delta Rising. Each of these missions allow for scaling rewards, increasing the amount of Delta Marks received if you are able to perform above expectations and or complete bonus objectives. I like that, so can cl uh, complete some bonus objectives, get a little more Marks. That's good for me. I like all the marks I can get. Ancient power cells can also be earned by participating in the higher difficulty versions of cute events, which rewards Delta marks. Ancient power cells can be found in the wreckage of numerous recent battles that have taken place in Delta Quadrant. By harnessing the potential of these uh, powerful relics, advanced technologies have been developed that were previously beyond the reach of the Alpha Quadrant scientists and engineers. High-end gear projects will require a small amount of ancient power cells in order to claim the best equipment that the Delta Alliance has to offer. They may also be submitted to the Alliance in return for dilithium ore. So that's basically, excuse me, that's basically the other uh, thing that you need to buy uh, reputation gear. There's always, you know, you need the marks, but then there's always that extra little thing that they add on there, like it requires five cells or five, you know, whatevers um, to uh, it, to the reputation. So it looks like they're continuing that as well. I don't really see the point in that, but whatever. Rewards. 
with your Delta Marks and ancient power cells in hand, you'll be able to submit these for both Reputation XP and new high-quality gear acquisitions. Here are some of the items. Okay, so uh, a first look at some of the items we're going to get in Delta Reputation. Um, Delta Alliance Deflector Array. So it looks like we've got a whole space set here going. Um, this deflector is designed to improve the ship's offensive abilities by providing bonuses to Starship Shield and Auxiliary Power, as well as added structural integrity and hull repair. I like that. Delta Alliance Hyper-Efficient Engines. This engine offers a good maximum speed and a bonus to turn rate and engine power with improved control resistance. Ooh, that's good. I like that. An engine that has built-in turn rate and uh, speed. Delta Alliance Unimatrix Shield Array. Ooh, so this looks like it's taken from the Borg technology here, the Unimatrix uh, Borg stuff. This, these Unimatrix shields offer a high shield capacity and enhanced resistance to Polaron damage, of all things. I'm, I'm surprised by that. The shield also benefits from increased resistances to energy damage and to shield drains. Ooh, I like that. So it looks like a unique shield as well. A, uh, a new trajector warp core, matter, antimatter, and then a singularity version for Romulans. This trajector warp core converts a portion of your ship's engine power to shield power. It also has the ability to use a specialized trajector jump during combat and a built-in transwarp coil to the Delta Quadrant. Ooh, so you can transwarp to the Delta Quadrant at any time. I like that. Uh, but this uh, trajector jump sounds a lot like a console ability that's already in the game. There's this console that's called, like, subspace jump or something. It allows you to, like, jump um, behind an enemy or in front of an enemy or something like that. So I don't know how, how that's going to be similar or not, but it uh, sounds like it. So um, right there, a uh, engine shield deflector um, warp core space set. And I, I'm guessing there will be um, bonuses with that that obviously they're not telling us right now. But uh, there will be, you know, a two-piece, three-piece, and probably four-piece bonus uh, associated with those. Can't wait to find out what those bonuses will be. Uh, I also hope that these have new visuals because... Obviously, uh, some of the space sets they have released do not have visuals attached to them. Some of them do, some of them don't. And I'm really disappointed in the ones that don't have visuals attached to the shield, the engine, and the deflector. Um, I also think they should add visuals to warp cores. I would like to see something change on my ship when I put a unique warp core on it. Somehow, some way, either the geometry of the ship in some way or some form, or lighting on the ship. Something about the ship needs to change when you put on a unique warp core. Each warp core needs to have a unique look. Kind of give people the idea, you know, that you are using a different kind of warp core, a unique warp core. Uh, I hope that they expand to that in the future one day. I would love to see it. All right, Delta Alliance Ordnance. Uh, so this sounds like ground stuff. Uh, no, that's a console. So this is space stuff. Console, universal, bioneural gel packs. Obviously, Voyager right here. The bioneural gel pack console was designed to improve computer system efficiency. This universal console provides a bonus to all subsystems, a shield systems bonus, and a cooldown reaction on bridge officer abilities. Now, my question is, this is like, what, you know, 50 years after Voyager or whatever. Why aren't all ships using bioneural gel packs already? If we are in the future from Voyager, like 50 years and we are in the 25th century, and apparently bioneural gel packs were um, successful on Voyager. Why are not the ships today using them in Star Trek Online? It seems like all the ships would be using bioneural gel packs by now, so it seems weird having a ship that doesn't have it. But still, as a um, as an ability, as a console ability, this makes a lot of sense in the game, since uh, one of the big points about Voyager was the bioneural gel packs. So being able to have that option on your ship makes a lot of sense, and I'm glad it's finally in here. Advanced Thoron-infused Polaron weapon. So it looks like the energy weapon choice for this one is going to be Polaron energy. Polaron, which are the purple ones. A lot of people don't use Polarons, um, but they are they are in the game, and now I guess they're going to be a little more useful. Maybe more people will use Polarons. Um, now that they are available, now that they are, um, they are going to probably be more useful. 
a beam array. This beam array is infused with Thoron, which can inflict Thoron radiation upon its target. A Thoron radiation causes radiation damage over time to enemies, which also inhibits their offensive capabilities. Dual heavy cannons is infused with Thoron, same thing. And a Neutronic Torpedo. Neutronic torpedoes deal considerable damage and have an enormous explosion radius, which can inflict Neutronic radiation. Neutronic radiation interferes with the ship's power transfer rate, resulting in reduced damage output. So a unique set there. Can't wait to get that. Here's the ground stuff. Delta Alliance Combat Armor. This combat-ready body armor grants the wearer excellent resistance to physical, kinetic, and energy damage. It also offers tremendous resistance to root stun and knockback. The body's armor's exoskeleton can greatly amplify the wearer's physical constitution, allowing the wearer to resist greater damage. Upon earning all the ground set, you'll be automatically granted a costume unlock for the purposes of displaying the unique visuals that accompany this armor. It's a good thing that the ground armor still has unique visual. Uh, I don't know if she's wearing it there. It doesn't look unique there, but I guess that she's just showing off the weapon. So I can't wait to see what the new armor looks like. Uh, Delta Alliance Unimatrix Personal Shield. This personal shield generator was designed to better handle the threats of the Delta Quadrant. Utilizing the Unimatrix technology, the shield greatly resists any shield drain effects. Additionally, the shield has an increased capacity, allowing to absorb higher than normal amounts of damage. And a compression ri a phaser rifle. So this is going to be phaser technology here, a phaser energy type. The compression phaser rifle fire, uh, fire mode is able to rapid... <laughs> okay, let's start over again. The compression phaser rifle's primary fire mode is able to rapid-fire bolts of energy at a target, while its secondary fire mode has a wide beam array, setting, a wide beam setting, which is very effective at stunning targets. The compression rifle's primary fire mode can also expose targets. When targeting the exposed enemy, the secondary fire mode automatically changes the tactical orbital strike, causing considerable damage to the target after a short target period. Interesting. Changes to a tactical orbital strike. Huh, cool. Also available in Disruptor Energy. Okay, so you got a choice of phaser or disruptor energy for the ground weapon there. Each of the above sets also provides powerful bonuses when equipped, so um, I'm looking forward to the bonuses. In addition to these elite equipment sets, advancing through the tiers of the Delta Alliance will unlock access to a large array of Thoron-infused Polaron energy weapons. Excuse me, and Thoron infused quantum torpedoes and mines. Three unique kit modules will also be included in reputation. Each is restricted to a single profession. So it looks like Thoron infused Polaron is their new hybrid energy type uh, for Delta Rising. So I guess that will make Polarons more useful now. And you know what that's going to mean? Get your uh, get your uh, tactical Polaron consoles now because prices in the exchange will go up a whole lot once all this is released in game because people will want to buff their Polaron energy with those tactical consoles. So, a uh, word of wisdom right now, buy them now because prices are going to go through the roof uh, when this comes out. Okay, you've got, uh, these are the kit modules, a tactical kit module called Neutronic Grenade attaches the Neutronic Large Radius Blast Effect to an existing photon grenade causing neutronic radiation to foes and that is awesome and I love this visual here maybe that's the neutronic blast because that is incredible I love that all right engineer neutronic mortar just like an existing mortar fabrication but with the added large blast radius of neutronics and then a neutronic radiation for scientists new surrounds the target and a neutronic radiation cloud dealing increased damage so neutronic radiation big thing for delta rising Oh, good. Here's the uh, traits. Oh, no, these are traits, not the abilities. Okay, the following passive abilities can be unlocked by advancing your standing with the Delta Alliance, right? So each reputation obviously has traits that you can choose to use. Trait uh, Tier 1, ground. You've got physical conditioning, which is increased run speed, or armor protection, which weapons penetrate a percent of the victim's armor. Tier 2 space, you've got advanced engines, which is increased engine speed and turn rate. Ooh, that's going to be good, especially on a cruiser. Or enhanced armor penetration. Ship's weapons penetrate a percent of enemy ship's armor. Tier 3 ground, reactive healing accelerator. On critical, it triggers a self-heal or rendering shot, uh, rend rending shots. Each shot fire increases the chance to crit. Once a crit occurs, the increase is reset to normal. And then Tier 4 space. Reactive ship repairs on crit triggers a ship self heal or enhanced rendering rending shots, which each ship weapon fired increases the chance to crit once crit occurs. Normal, okay. 
It's a lot of offensive abilities here, but also some stuff to deal with turn rate and less energy drain and energy power and auxiliary power too on one of them. All right. In addition to these passes, completing your advancement will, yes, you've got a powerful tier, I guess, five, uh, you would call it ground ability, that, an active power that you can enable. Uh, this one is called Concussive Tachyon Emission. Generates a large tachyon blast that deals damage and nullifies enemy shields for a short time. Maybe that's what this is. Wow. Sounds neat. A lot of big explosions for Delta Rising, it sounds like. This Thor, this uh, new, I forgot the name already. I want to say Neutronium. It's um, Neutronic. Neutronic explosions are huge. That explosion is huge. All these are about huge explosions. Um, so that's coming. So that's the all about the reputation. I'm looking forward to it. Again, I hope there's visuals on the space stuff. And uh, looking forward to <laughs> another grind. But, I mean... We should not expect any less, should we? All right. Um, now it's time for... I, I saw something about this in the forums. I, I was reading the forums over the last couple of weeks. And uh, there was a post to uh, to some somewhere that was explaining the, the thought and idea uh, that went into designing these Tier 6 intelligence ships, as they're called. And remember in the last video, I said that I thought these were very ugly, or designed very ugly. Um, there's actually a reason for their the way they are designed, and it has to deal with the fact that they are intelligence ships. They are stealthy ships. However, I mean, come on now. This is space. You don't really have to design a ship, you know, that is like round and smooth, you know, to be stealthy. You could have a cube, and as long as you've got a good cloaking device, you're stealthy. So... You know, I don't really fall in line with that thinking that, you know, a ship has to look, quote, stealthy, like a stealth bomber or something. You know, it has to look stealthy in space because it really doesn't. It's really all about the technology and the kind of, like, jamming you can do. Maybe, like, radar jam. Well, they don't use radars, but you know what I mean? Sensor jamming or, you know, cloaking or whatever. Any kind of thing like that on a ship is what's going to make the difference, not how the ship looks. How the ship looks, you're still if you've got advanced sensors, you're still going to be able to detect it no matter what how the ship looks. So the look of the ship shouldn't affect the fact that it is an intelligent, stealthy ship. But that's the way they've designed these ships anyway. That's what they've done. So let's read this, and, and maybe we'll get a better idea of what what their ideas were here. All right. Uh, and there's a car alarm going off outside. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, all right. Designing a unique aesthetic for all of our new intelligence ships was a great creative opportunity and an exercise in fusing a bold new style with more traditional design elements. I don't know about traditional, but okay. Our unique and thematic intelligence powers inspired us to define an aesthetic to visually communicate the specific themes and properties of intelligence for a new cohesive subset subset of ships. Well, I don't agree with that because just like I said, you don't. It doesn't matter how the ships look in space. It all, what matters are the technologies used to disguise it or make it be an intelligent ship, not how it looks. It could be a cube and it would still be a stealthy ship. <laughs> so, anyway, embracing this theme, we could design outside some of the normal tenets. And considerations we adhere to with our 2410 fest. You know what I see these ships as? Cryptic is basically saying, you know what? We're going to break away a little bit from Star Trek design and we're going to do our own thing. And we're going to, we, we, we've got some creative ideas in house, you know. We got some, that, this is what Cryptic's thinking. We got some creative guys here. They got some cool sci fi ship designs. Let's give them the opportunity to, to, to give us some really uh, unique designs, something we, we wouldn't normally see in Star Trek, so they can get their creative juices going and, and let them have a little fun. That's what I'm seeing this as, because I just don't see visually that these are Star Trek ships. I'm Brad Stoken, art director of Star Trek Online, and in this article I'll explain how we set out to achieve our goals. Creating a unique new thematic style for our intelligence ships while adhering to certain fundamental designs. See, they're just going to adhere to those fundamental designs. They're not going to, you know, strictly make Star Trek looking ships. <laughs> We began our discussion of visual design goals using the information we had for our intelligence ships. We knew the number of ships we were going to make, their roles, stats, and general abilities. We also had a broad understanding of many of the intelligence powers. 
Our first step was to define a new aesthetic language to visually communicate the intelligence theme. Then we would apply this aesthetic language to each ship we plan to make, using the existing ship and a similar role to each new intelligence ship as a template of inspiration. Our goals were as follows. Visual language. Define a unique aesthetic language to visually communicate the theme of intelligence. Well, but intelli that doesn't make sense. Cohesion. To apply this uniform visual language to all intelligence sense, regardless of role size or faction. Fusion. To achieve a blending of originality and familiar, familiar, familiarity. I don't know why I'm having trouble talking today. To take a familiar starting point for each ship and apply our intelligence language to create a merger of something unique and familiar. Visual language. Our first... Now, I kind of like some of these designs. These aren't bad. Oh, this design right here, that's kind of cool looking. Why didn't they go with that? And here's like an, a, an enterprise type design. I like that a lot. That one's all right. Not too bad. I like these designs. Why didn't, why didn't they go with these designs? If these are their early sketches, which is what I'm guessing... Why didn't they stick with that? This one almost looks like a rocket with warp engines. <laughs> but seriously, this one looks really cool. Why didn't they stick with this? This would have been so much better than what we have now. Oh, wow. I want these. Uh, why don't... Th this always happens. They always... You know, artists or whatever, they always create their original sketches, and for some reason, their original sketches always look better than the final product. You notice that? Because I do. Visual language. Our first challenge was to define our unique and cohesive intelligence. Yeah, we know that. Uh, these are the properties they want to communicate. Stealthy, which a ship doesn't need to look stealthy to be stealthy, but whatever. I mean, if, it, if it's a ship in today's time, Earth, 21st century, flying in the air, yeah, you would want it to look stealthy. And actually, you need that look to be stealthy to create the deflection that deflects radar because the way radar works, um, it, you know, it bounces off a target or whatever. But you need it to be shaped at certain angles to deflect the radar. So in today's time, it makes a lot of sense for the way a ship looks or a um, an aircraft, because that makes sense. It has to it has to have those angles to to jam radar basically, or not to be on radar. But in space, they don't use radar. They're using sensors and all this stuff, advanced sci-fi stuff. So how a ship looks doesn't make a difference. <laughs> but uh, apparently. It does in Star Trek Online. Agile, maneuverable, aggressive, compact, ability to gather. Now, I can see the idea The idea of a ship being compact makes sense. If you need a, a lot of maneuverability, a bigger ship is going to be slower, right? So a compact ship for maneuverability's sake makes sense. The look of it, not necessarily, but the for, for, uh, for maneuverability, compact makes sense. Ability to gather intelligence and ability to expose and exploit weakness. With this in mind, we set out to identify specific stylistic choices to communicate these properties. We began with visual reference gathering and brainstorming using both modern day and futuristic inspiration. See, they're not using Star Trek inspiration. They're using modern day and futuristic you know, sci-fi inspiration, not Star Trek inspiration. To search for shapes, materials, colors, and more to tell the story of ships that could appear without warning, scan their foes, and exploit their weakness with a lightning-fast alpha strike. Okay. When exploring shapes, we gravitated to a language featured prominently in modern stealth aircraft and fighter design. Yeah, it makes sense in today's aircraft. It doesn't make sense in 25th century spaceships. <laughs> There's a difference, guys. Um, Sharp-edged planes meeting in angular lines and tapering to sharp points or thin blade-like edges. Yeah, because they have to do that in order to deflect the radar. But you don't... In, you don't do that in, in Star Trek. <laughs> this helped us to find aggressive and dangerous looking shapes, evocative of swift, silent edged weapons. <laughs> Since when does Starfleet make ships that look like weapons? That just doesn't make sense in Starfleet. Uh, that's just not Starfleet. We also investigated the lines and shapes of angular low prof profile racing cars. <laughs> are, we, are we designing cars or, or spaceships here? Capturing the scene of speed as well as the idea of low drag air. You don't need low drag aerodynamic shapes in space. The whole reason Borg create cubes is because it's more efficient and you can fly cubes in space. <laughs> I mean, come on, guys. You don't need aerodynamic shapes in space. 
While our ships wouldn't be concerned with drag in the vacuum space, thank you, the minimal profile helped to evoke a sense of ship uh, so sleek and with such a minuscule energy profile it could swiftly and silently slip past foes. And that makes no sense whatsoever. Now, compact makes sense because you want to be maneuverable, but make it make it minuscule make it minuscule so it can silently slip past foes um the the shape has nothing to do with that <laughs> having begun to nail the shapes we were looking for we turned our attention to materials let's uh, go ahead and look at this image uh, right here click on that ooh that's a nice image here we go okay so this is what we have now deflector closed and open it's still a weird design Agile, maneuverable, compact, hard edges, implied stealth tech, echoes of familiar shapes. No. It just doesn't look good. Ooh, that's big. Ah, oh, I made the whole thing go away. I closed the tab. I didn't mean to do that. Where were we? Uh, let's go back. Here we go. Having begun to nail the shapes we are looking for, we turn our attention to materials. We selected dark colors to denote invisibility and stealth and build a sense of danger or menace, evoking a silent warrior cloaked against the stillness of space, yet we also needed to preserve visibility. To this end, we explored unique patterns and areas with high gloss finish to accent parts of the whole. Okay, so you want to design... Let's get this straight, guys. You want to design your ship for, um, for stealth, so you make the shapes stealthy whatever that means but then you'd make it glossy so that it can reflect light reflect sunlight reflect you know make it visible uh that to me makes no sense you know what i would do if i wanted to make a quote stealthy ship i would make it matte black matte black in space would be hard to visually see if you want to make you know if you're looking out your window let's say you don't have sensors you're looking out your window a matte black object in space would probably be impossible to identify, especially if it's not moving, if it's just sitting there. A matte black object you wouldn't be able to see in space. But you make it glossy, it's going to reflect light. So you've already gone against your word of creating an intelligence-looking ship by making it glossy. Also, we utilize, oh, let's, th this makes it even better. We utilize thin strips of glowing spill light to call out the shapes against the dark materials. Oh, yeah. So we're going to make a stealthy looking ship, but let's accent it with glowing lights so that everybody can see our ship accented in space. Well, that makes no sense if you really wanted to make an intelligence looking ship. Good gosh. What are these people thinking? This is especially useful given the relative absence of windows. What does that have to do with anything? Which were intentionally minimized. Why would what does having no windows have to do with having accented lights? Oh, good gosh! Our final goal was to de develop a visual way to denote the ship's ability to actively gather intelligence on an enemy's weakness. First, we proposed and developed unique sensor arrays embedded into the hull to avoid breaking up the sleek hull surface. We embedded these behind translucent panels. I, I guess that's okay. It looks like a Ship with headlights. <laughs> this one is not as bad. Out of all of the intelligence ships, this one looks okay. Kind of an, an elongated defiant. This one looks okay. I could get behind this one. But it's the other ones I can't get behind. However, we still wanted something more dynamic. So the idea of an active, launched, intel-gathering probe or drone, drone emerged from another brainstorming. This would take the form of a click power, deploying a drone which flies to its target, scanning for weakness, and sending the intelligence back to the ship. Yeah, that kind of makes sense. Sending out a drone instead of sending out your whole ship. This is the design I can't get over. This is the one that makes no sense to me. It's the stupid deflector thing on the top. The way it's angled, it, just, it makes the ship look upside down. Now that I'm seeing that there's another one on the bottom, that helps, but this thing on the top, no. No. Uh-uh. No. Also, they've gone with this opened donut shape here, which reminds us a whole lot of the vengeance from JJ's Star Trek. Uh, and I believe that is probably where they got that inspiration, because no other Starfleet ships 
are like that in the Prime Universe. So they probably took inspiration from the J.J. movie to make that open donut hole shaped saucer. Which I actually kind of like. I think it's cool looking. It's just this deflector. Take this deflector off the top of the ship and maybe you have an okay looking ship. I would still want to probably extend the warp cores out a little bit. Put, put a pylon on there, extend the warp cores out a little bit, remove this deflector, and you've got a great looking ship. As it is now, it just doesn't look right. It looks, it looks, it looks upside down every time you look at it. Uh, here's what the drone looks like. I like the look of the drone. That's cool looking. They did a better job on the drone than anything. In summary, these were the stylistic elements we chose to communicate each intelligence property. Stealthy, hard edges, yeah, agile, maneuverable, swept back and tapered lines. Aggressive, hard edged, blade shaped, compact, stripped down, look, negative space, lack of bulky extras. That makes sense. Ability to gather intelligence using sensor drones. Uh, visible and active sensor pod probes. The Romulan one looks really, excuse me again, the Romulan one looks really good here. This looks like a stealth fighter that you would find today, but in a Romulan form. Um, this is really nice. I, I like this. The, the hard angles and lines on this ship really worked for it. Uh, I know I was against it on the Federation ships, but on this ship, it looks good. Um, and it's not... It's, it's, it makes sense, and it's, it's still you know designed like a Romulan ship. It looks good. I look at the profile here on the front and the back. That is a slim profile, all right. That makes sense on this ship. That's Romulan. That's very Romulan. I love the design on this one. I'm going to fly this ship. Balance. Applying language to familiar templates. Having decided on our intelligence visual language, we selected for each new ship a familiar touchstone or template to which we would apply the language. We would design three Federation ships and one ship each for Klingon and Romulan factions with their roles. And see, what? Oh, yeah, let's design three ships for the Federation, only one for the for the Klingons and one for the Romulans. What is the deal with them not giving proper detail and attention to the Romulan and, and Klingon faction? Do they hate the other factions in the game? I don't understand it. Federation Escort. Inspiration is the Defiant and Tempest. I, I see that in the Escort. The Federation Cruiser. Inspiration for of the Sovereign and the Prometheus. Uh, pfft, came out wrong. Federation Science, Inspiration of Luna and Horizon came out wrong. Klingon Battle Cruiser, Inspiration of Negvar, Vorcha, Vorkang. Ramblin' Warbird, Inspiration of De Dalan uh, and Dehel, and <laughs> I probably said that wrong, and Tavaro. I like the Romulan ship. Looks good. In each case, we use certain fundamental elements of the Inspiration ships while applying our intelligence language for a unique twist. For example, we apply the intelligence language of negative space and combat design uh, to the science vessel's hull and saucer to make it feel more maneuverable and agile to the Klingon battlecruiser we apply thin blade like shapes to the head and the cells for a more aggressive look and long tapering angled shapes to evoke more agility and maneuverability let's look at the Klingon ship I like the looks of the Klingon ship too it kind of looks uh, yeah it looks like a Klingon ship looks like an advanced Klingon ship a more probably more like 26th century Klingon ship I would think it's just more advanced it looks, looks newer it looks Looks like a new century kind of ship. So the Romulan and the Klingon ships, I like. Uh, but the Federation ones, there's really only one that I like. The ret kind, and even then, only about like kind of sorta. In the end, we achieve our goal of blending a visually evocative new intelligence aesthetic. Yet we also want a place to be able to further customize these ships to fit their own. To that end, we have been creating numerous configuration options. Okay, this makes me feel a little bit better. Knowing that there's going to be, quote, numerous configuration options for each ship, as well as enabling traditional faction materials. Um, that is good. The fact that we are going to have numerous customizations. In fact, I can see that there are numerous customizations. Here's the classic material, and it, it looks like the uh, hole is closed here. I hope one of the configuration options is to take off this deflector. <laughs> I so hope so. Um, on, on this ship... It's just so bad. I don't even know where to start with it. The nacelles, the, the how long it is compared to how stumpy the uh, nacelles are. Just it's not proportioned correctly. Proportion just looks terrible on it. Absolutely terrible. I don't even know where to go with that ship. I hope there's a lot of configuration options. 
because I'm going to need them. In the end, players will have the option to fully embrace our new intelligence aesthetic, complete with its aggressive and stealthy style, or tweak components and materials for a more traditional look. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed this look. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, so there's a background. You guys have heard my opinion. You may disagree with me. That is completely okay. You may love these ships to death, or you may hate them to death, or you may be on the fence. Um, I guess the only way we'll know really is uh, when we get in game with these ships and we're able to use them and customize them and um, hopefully hopefully make them our own. But that's what we're getting anyway. Let's move on. We've talked about that. Okay, gear upgrades. Stay with me. I know this video is going to be kind of long, but there's so much material to go over here. As part of the new level increase in Delta Rising, we're bringing up the mark of the gear available. Your captain will now be able to use mark 13 and 14 gear, so we knew that was coming. And the best part is you'll be able to do this by upgrading your existing gear to make it better. So all the complaints about, you know, you know, having to upgrade ships, oh my ship's only gonna be tier five now, it's not gonna be tier it's not gonna be the highest tier anymore. Well, same thing's gonna happen to your gear, and that's just a natural thing. You know, Mark 12, very rare gear is going to not be the best gear anymore. Now you're gonna want very rare Mark 14 gear, and that's the way MMMs MMs MMs. That's the way MMs go. Uh, that's the way MMOs go. New stuff comes out uh, for the better, higher tiers, and your current stuff is no longer the best, and so you, you grind for more stuff, right? I think that's kind of standard MMO fare, or, it, you know, it, it, it should be. It, should, it, is, it is. That's the standard way things go. So I don't think anybody should be surprised by that. If you are and you're throwing tantrums because your Mark 12 stuff is no longer the high stand, that's your fault because you don't understand how MMOs work. <laughs> With the upgrade system, you can take any gear that has a mark and improve it. If you have a favorite weapon from a mission but it's not up to the quality that you need, or if you have an old version of gear that isn't up to the best mark that your character can use, you can now make that gear better. The upgrade system will let you take those Breen Shields, Caustic Plasma Beans, and old Mark 10 uh, Mako armor and improve them to Mark 12 and beyond. Fleet gear upgrades work the same way. The gear will keep its current mods, and it will go up in mark, and can potentially become epic or gold quality gear. Okay, so this is not such a bad thing. There is an upgrade path for your gear. I don't know how that's going to work out, but an upgrade path for all your gear. So that means the fleet stuff that you've spent time and money on is not going to remain static. You will be able to upgrade it. That's good news. That, that should make everybody feel better. And now we know there's even a higher than probably very rare. There's this epic or gold quality. So there will be epic gear beyond very rare and, and ultra rare, I guess beyond ultra rare too, because there's a purplish ultra rare quality now also. But I guess even beyond that, there's going to be a gold or epic gear. So yeah, wow, that's, that's interesting. To upgrade your gear, you'll apply new tech upgrade items. Tech upgrades will initially come in three grades, basic, improved, and superior. Each tech upgrade works on a specific type of item. You can purchase basic te tech upgrades from vendors on Earth or Kronos, but you'll need to craft improved or superior tech upgrades or purchase them from the exchange or from a friend with a high level of R&D skill. Tech upgrades don't require dilithium to purchase or craft, but applying a tech upgrade package does cost dilithium. The better tech upgrades provide more tech points and are more efficient with your dilithium investment. Each time you apply a tech upgrade, your item gains tech points. When the item earns enough tech points, it is eligible to upgrade. The number of tech points required to upgrade varies by the type of item, the quality of the item, and the mark of the item. For example, a green Mark IV ground weapon and a blue Mark XI space shield will require different numbers of tech points before they are eligible to upgrade. Choosing to upgrade the item puts it in one of your special upgrade slots as the new improved technology is brought online. After enough time has passed, a few minutes for a low mark item, a few hours for a top tier item, you will be able to claim the item from your upgrade slot and use it at its new higher mark. If you're in a real hurry, you can use a little dilithium to speed up the process, just like crafting an item with research and development. Huh. Okay, so we've got some kind of new dialogue box here, which is going to allow us to upgrade 
items or upgrade gear. So a new an upgrade system. So this whole upgrade thing is just totally brand new to Star Trek Online, being able to upgrade our gear this way. And it looks like if you are a crafter, this will be a good thing because you can get these uh, upgrade things and you can get the superior ones. You can get the, the really good ones if you're a crafter. Um, otherwise, you're stuck with the basic ones um, if you don't craft. Or you, I guess you will be able to buy these also in the exchange, although I imagine people will charge a fortune for them because they're going to be a commodity. Um, so... I don't know how that's going to work out. I'm not a crafter, you see. I don't craft a darn thing. My crafting skill is zero because I just don't craft. So the only way I'm going to be able to get superior stuff to upgrade things is if I purchase it. And my resources are, are already thin. I don't have enough energy credits. So that's that could be a problem. So really, this looks like this... This upgrade stuff can really benefit people that are big into crafting. If you've got a high crafting level, you're really good in the crafting stuff, those people are the ones that are going to have the more epic gold stuff. While adding tech upgrades, you'll also add research points, which can give the item a quality improvement. There's a small chance that your item will go to the next better quality, from common to uncommon, uncommon to rare, or rare to very rare. You can even reach ultra rare, ultraviolet, or epic gold quality with upgrades, even on gear that normally doesn't come in that quality. So let's see, we got, let's count how many levels of gear we have now. We've got the normal white stuff, we've got uncommon green, we've got rare um, blue, we've got very rare purple, we've got ultra rare, which is violet, we've got uh, now gold or epic, which is gold. So that is six. We have six qualities of gear now. Incredible. That's a lot. Hmm. And I'm not going to be happy till I have epic gold on everything. Because I'm just that way. Uh, more grinding for me. All right. Um, once you've reached the maximum mark for your gear, you can keep applying upgrades for a chance to get a quality improvement. Each time you apply enough tech points, you can attempt to an upgrade again. If you don't get the quality improvement on an item... At the maximum mark, you can keep trying, and your chance will continue to increase until you succeed. R&D deploys upgrades. Though you can purchase basic tech upgrade packages, these are most useful for upgrading low mark items. Having research and development skills will allow you to make your own tech upgrades. Each school includes recipes for making tech upgrades for your items of its type. At level 5, in an R&D school, you can make basic tech upgrades. At level 10, you can make improved tech. And at 15, you can make superior tech. These tech upgrades packages don't cost you any of the lithium to craft, and you can trade or sell them at your discretion. Just like R&D, the upgrades come in groups related to the seven schools. Beam weapons, consoles, cannon consoles, engineering for engineers and engineering consoles, science for deflections, shields, ground armor, projectiles, all that, blah, blah, blah. When you craft a tech upgrade, you'll make one based on your choice of school, usable for upgrading items of that type. To improve the upgrade process, you can also acquire upgrade accelerators. Good, good gosh. it's <laughs> a lot here. These items are used in conjunction with a tech upgrade to give more tech points or improve the chance of a quality improvement. Upgrade accelerators come in three grades, minor, standard, and major. These grades exist for both tech point accelerators and research point accelerators. The higher the grade, the more improve your tech upgrades. Applying a major accelerator to, to a superior tech upgrade will give you a lot more tech points or a much better chance for a quality improvement. You can pick up accelerators from crafting packs purchased from the sea store or from certain special missions. So another sea store item for them to make money off of. Uh, you can try the new system, which is now on Tribble. So, wow, okay, a lot going on there. Not sure how that's all going to work out, uh, but... Good gosh, that's a lot of stuff. All right, let's move on. The official release date. Proud to announce Star Trek Online Delta Rising released on October 14th. I thought we already knew that. Well, now we know it again. We kicked off design and planning for Delta Rising in December of last year, laying out the foundations for the most ambitious update to the game to date. We started early with a plan to raise the level cap from 50 to 60. This required us to revisit how leveling works, work out challenges, diff difficulty on opponents, opponents, figure out how we would get Mark 14 gear into the game and how the next tier Starship would work. It has taken most of a year to bring all these pieces together. 
But that wasn't all. We wanted this expansion to take on the Delta Quadrant, and we plotted out the year with Tim Russ playing Tuvok. We set the team loose to learn all they could about it by watching seven years of Star Trek Voyager episodes so they would be well-versed in the species look and stories that took place there. And then we worked out more than six months bringing all these details to life in new stories that accurately reproduced and extended upon the show. And finally... We anchored it all with the decision to pursue getting multiple members of the bridge crew of Voyager to reprise their roles in games. As Star Trek fan ourselves, we're excited to have Jerry Ryan, Robert Mercado, Ethan Phillips, and Garrett Wang to join their peers in bringing Star Trek to life. These are all of fine actors, and it's been a pleasure working with them. Their performances are outstanding, and you're going to love having them be part of the story. I look forward to seeing you in-game in just a few weeks to enjoy the grand story that is Star Trek Online, Death Rising, and all the bugs that will come with it in the first week. We all know that's going to happen. All right. Um, Neelix Returns. Of course, we knew that also. Updating Neelix's story. On Star Trek Voyager, we saw Neelix as an explorer, a trader, a chef, a morale officer, and a diplomat in a very annoying Jar Jar-like character. I added that last little bit. Um, he got better, I guess, as Voyager went on, but at first, yeah. A native of the Delta Quadrant, Neelix was Voyager's guide and helped them navigate the often tricky politics and shifting boundaries of the Quadrant. He was a valued member of the crew and always had a warm cup of even better than coffee substitutes and a sympathetic ear for crew's problems. The first question we asked when adding Neelix to Delta Rising was, what would he be after Voyager returned home? Neelix left Voyager in Homestead, choosing to stay at a Talaxian mining colony while the ship continued on its journey home. At that point, it looked like Neelix was going to add the roles of husband and father to his already prodigious list of titles, and that was a good place for Voyager to leave Neelix. He'd found his home. But it's been 32 years since Voyager left the Delta Quadrant. In that time, Neelix has settled into family life. But he's also become a statesman and a leader, taking the lessons he learned on Voyager Neelix is now the head of the group of Talaxians he found in Homestead. He sent out ships and made new trading contracts, uh, contacts, found other Talaxians, and turned a group struggling for survival into a thriving community. The Talaxians stayed on the base seen in Homestead for several years, but the growing size of the colony and a completely unsuitable kitchen prompted Neelix to lead them elsewhere. The colony is now settled in the Intaba system, a safer area, with more resources, resources available to support their operations. But moving day for the Talaxians is coming again soon. There are enough of them now to support a colony, and Neelix's survey ships have found a suitable M-Class world nearby. Creating Neelix and Stowe was fun and very rewarding. As one of the most uh, memorable characters of Voyager, getting his likeness was extremely important to us. Yeah, that looks pretty good. Um, we scoured the Voyager episodes, poured through many still images, and even read reference material to nail down what Neelix looks like. One of the challenges of a video game is to bring out features of a character that are easily seen from a distance. To that end, we brought out the jowls of the face, hmm. accentuated the nose, pulled the ends of the eyes down, and gave him a unique Talaxian hairdo. We also gave him very colorful and patterned clothing, uh, such that no other crew member in Voyager looks like him. Yeah, that's true. Well, he looks more like Sonic the Hedgehog, but okay. With that hairstyle. Um, but of course, visuals are just part of the equation. When paired to, uh, to the voice work of Ethan Phillips, it truly does feel like Neelix is in the game. We feel the character model looks and feels like Neelix. Warm and friendly, but ready for action should the situation arise. Very interesting. Okay, Galactic News Networks. Designing the Voyager MSD, and I do not know what MSD stands for. I've heard that term before, and I don't know what it stands for. <laughs> I, I can't venture a guess right now. If I think about it, maybe. Greeting, Captains. My name is Tim Shikata Davies, and I am one of the graphic artists who works at Perfect World. I work with several titles, including Star Trek Online, and I'm a longtime player of the game. So these aren't even original cryptic members making this. This is like um, uh, perfect world people. Star Trek Online is set in 2410. That is a whopping 32 years after Voyager returned home. As such, the ship has most likely undergone a few refits, including updating the L cars to the style we have in-game. As such, using the original MSD created 
by Doug Drexler was not really a viable option for you. So what about recreating the MSD? So what I'm taking here is MSD refers to, I guess, the design of the ship or whatever. But um, something structural design, maybe, I don't know. But it's interesting to me that they have taken into consideration that this is 32 years after Voyager and that Voyager itself, because apparently it didn't go into a museum, it's still in, it's still in, um, it's still in commission as a starship 32 years after Voyager, which may or may not be odd. Some people were complaining in the forums, you know, does it make sense that Voyager, you know, is still commissioned as a ship 32 years after Voyager because, you know, it's kind of old, but you know, Star Starfleet ships do last over 100, 100 years. They can last over 100 years. I mean, you refit them a few times, and they can definitely go the distance. So it's not impossible that it would still be a ship. The reason why I think it would not be is because it would be a ship that they might want to put in a museum. In fact, in the in one of the alternate futures of Voyager, it was a museum piece. Uh, the, the one that Janeway came back in time for, it, Voyager... Uh, was a museum piece that the that in, inspired uh, Academy people, so Starfleet Academy, you know, cadets. So I would have thought they would have put it in a museum. There's other ships that can fulfill the role in, in the Delta Quadrant. But no, it's still a commissioned ship. But the fact that they have acknowledged that it would have undergone a few refits since then, I like that fact. So it looks like we're going to get maybe a little bit of a different styled Voyager. Which makes a lot of sense. It would be refit over time and uh, make it more up to date. I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't. None of none of the you know hundred year old ships that are in service are you know using that technology. They have been refitted and updated with you know newer stuff. So so would have Voyager. So I like that. The first task was to look at the existing and must identify any mistakes. It became apparent that the shape of the hole was not accurate to the actual shape of the ship. Oh, so maybe maybe MSD stands for like uh, what was originally in Star Trek Online. This is the most obvious around the deflector area. So the first task involved plotting out the general shape of the ship using renders of the CGI ship used in the show post season four. So I guess the CGI for the ship changed before season four. That's interesting. I didn't know that. Since the ship evolved in the show, there are several additions I wanted to add. Deck four, add a brig and away team briefing room. Okay, deck eight, add astrometrics. Yeah, because the original Voyager did not have an astrometrics. They created that later in the show. Deck eight, add a cargo bay, too, with a Borg alcove. Yeah, you've got... But why would the Borg alcove still be on Voyager? 32 years later, you'd think they would remove the Borg alcoves and that they would be studying that, you know, some somewhere in some facility, you know, <laughs> whatever. They wouldn't, they wouldn't keep those on Voyager. Why would they need Borg alcoves on Voyager? It doesn't make sense. Deck 9, add the Aero Shuttle. We never got to see the Aero Shuttle in Voyager. I'm a little disappointed by that. They always use their shuttles, which magically reappeared the next episode. They're magically never depleting shuttles. Then they created the Delta Flyer, and there were actually two variants of the Delta Flyer. But they never used the Aero Shuttle, which was probably more advanced than their shuttles. But they never once used it. It was there the whole time. Why didn't they use it in the show? I would have loved to have seen that. Deck 10, increase the shuttle base size to better accommodate the Delta, Delta Flyer and more accurately represent what we saw in the show. Deck 11, add the Airponics Bay. Again, why would you need an Airponics Bay now that we can get back and forth between the Delta Quadrant and here? Um, restructure the navigational deflector to better represent how it actually sits on the ship. Okay, good. Add additional deflector equipment for the slipstream drive. That's good because now we have slipstream drive. Makes sense. Make the warp nacelles to the correct size and restyle uh, warp coils to signify upgrades. I like that, because the warp system would have been upgraded over time. Many of these updates required reshuffling some of the existing rooms on the MSD. Also, a few rooms, such as sick bay, require, required alterations to better represent the sets that were seen on the show. So, um, I love the visual changes so far. Um, makes sense. Some of them doesn't make sense to be on the ship anymore, but the visual design choices make sense. One of the cross sections of the ship was a complete was was complete. I sent over the illustrator files to Taco Fangs. He then created the surrounding L, L cars to make it fit seamlessly onto the aft workstations on the bridge. 
We decided that to make the MSD more enjoyable to the players, we'd keep the labels to a minimum and put them at a size that would be legible. Taco Fangs did an awesome job, more so considering he was, restrict- he, he was restricted to a texture resolution of 2048, which is not terribly big. Um, we were also fortunate enough to get feedback from both Dead Drexler and Mike Akuda, the original gurus who worked on the show to help refine the final look. Okay, so that's nice. It's more in line with the show, and it it shows that it's been upgraded over time. I'm really looking forward to the new expansion. Uh, it has been a great experience. Okay, that's cool. You can find ooh wallpaper of it in our gallery. Ooh, let's look at it up close. Um, Voyager, oh, mas- Master System Display. That's what it stands for. Master System Display. Got to remember that. So that's what um, you would see on their console or whatever. I guess they took a lot of design from there. There's the Delta Flyer. It's definitely big in the shuttle bay. There's the Aero Shuttle that was, uh, again, never shown uh, or never used in the ship or never used in the show. Uh, what I found interesting when I, I was, uh, I saw this diagram somewhere else too. What I found interesting is that it looks like the ship has two deflector arrays. Yeah, it's got, it has a secondary deflector array up here. I guess I always knew that. I just never really thought about it. It's got the main deflector array and then a secondary deflector array here. Ready for those secondary deflectors, cryptic. They had it in Voyager series. It's time. Looks like there's a helicopter sitting right here. No, I have no idea what that is. Impulse engine, maybe? Yeah, I think that's the impulse. Uh, I think that would be the warp core. No, here's the warp core right here. Uh, that's the primary computer. Anyway, uh, if you want to look over how Voyager is laid out, uh, there you go. That's available. What else do we have here? Got Voyager's engineering section. Just what I would expect it to look like. This actually looks like it's from the show. If it looks like this in game, this is pretty good stuff. Well, I guess that's all there is right now. Okay. Well, I look forward to seeing um, more of that. What else do we have? Ah, yes, the Dauntless. I said in a, a previous video I was really wanting them to include the Dauntless in uh, Voyager. It would make sense if they were going to bring it into the game to do it during Delta Rising. Even though it's not a Federation uh, ship originally in Voyager, it was an alien ship, um, the design would have been in their database. Let's read about it. Once again, I'm happy to welcome you to Delta Quadrant. We've been mix, uh, making exciting announcements lately about many aspects of Delta Rising. From our uh, celebrity reveal to details on Tier 6 ships and specifics on advancing your captains to the new level. Well, in the spirit of exciting news, I'm pleased to announce a new addition uh, to the Delta Rising Operations Pack. The Dauntless Class Experimental Science Vessel has been added to the Delta Rising Operations Pack for anyone that has already purchased the pack or purchases the pack moving forward. The original Dauntless-class science vessel was discovered by the crew of the USS Voyager in the Delta Quadrant in 2374. Completely alien in origin, the ship and its quantum slipstream drive were created as a trap for the crew. Recently, however, specifications for the ship were discovered in the Delta Quadrant, and the Starfleet Corps of Engineers has been able to recreate this impressive starship as a Tier 6 vessel. Ooh, so the Dauntless is a Tier 6 ship. More details on the ship's stats will be available soon in a blog, so stay tuned. Ooh, but just the fact knowing that we're getting the Dauntless now, that's really cool. That is really cool. Looking forward to that. Because it was basically what introduced us to Slipstream and Voyager. and Probably gave us a lot of what we know about Slipstream, too. Um, it's very cool. Very cool. Okay. Q revamp. Balance of power. One of the most popular pastimes for players in Stowe is queued events in both ground and space. Special task forces and other queued events offer a great challenge and reward and are small-time commitment and, and are small-time commitments as well, meaning that a player with limited time can get one or two queues in and earn some decent loot, as well as collecting marks toward the various reputation systems. When Delta Rising and the level cap increase, we are taking a movement to re-examine the queued events and make some alterations to how they work. We are also adding new rewards that take advantage of our new research and development system. Normal is as normal does. 
Not many changes have been made to the normal modes of the queues. These remain as you have always enjoyed them. Only now, the in-game events have a minimum level requirement of 50. All captains and critters in normal mode, uh, did they just call me a critter, will be fighting at level 50. And those who enter the queues above that level will have their um, e efficacy lowered to that of level 50. Don't fret, you'll still have all your powers and bridge officer seats, but the numbers you produce will be scaled appropriately to the level of events. So basically, in normal mode, they're going to scale everyone back to level 50, no matter what level you are above that. Uh, that makes sense for normal mode, and it puts everybody on an even playing field for normal mode. Rewards for normal mode remain as they have always been in 9.5. You will receive marks and normal uh, R normal Q R and D material. Okay, so that's fine for I never play normal. I always play elite anyway. Advanced mode, formerly known as elite. Well, so my elite that I always play is now going to be known as advanced. Ooh, that means you're going to be something higher. Intriguing. All right. What you used to refer to as elite in our queued events and SDFs is now known as advanced. In the new advanced versions of the queues, you will see a similar level of challenge in the enemies that you were used to when the queues were labeled elite. In addition, players with captains under max level will find themselves bolstered up to level 60, the same level as their opponents. You won't gain seats or powers you didn't have, but your damage and other numerical values for your captain and ships will be scaled up to match what you would do at this higher level. Advanced does offer some new challenges as well. Many objectives that were optional in normal mode are now required in advanced mode. We hope you are paying attention during your playthrough of normal before jumping into advanced. Beginning with the release of Delta Rising, failure to complete these formerly optional objectives will result in the immediate failure of the mission. Dang! Dang, dang, dang! Ooh, this is going to be... You know why this is tough? You know, pugs, for one, they always fail those optionals because they don't know what they're doing. So if you fail some of these required optionals, now you fail the entire mission no matter what, whereas before you could still complete the mission without the optionals. This is going to change things big time. Wow. Oh, wow. This is going to make it terrible to do pugs now. Really terrible. You thought pugs were bad now. Holy crap. Pugs are about to get incredibly worse. <laughs> They'll be, all the missions will be failing. Upon failure, fail, failure, you will receive a portion of the rewards that you would have received for completing the mission. Oh, so you're still rewarded for your time spent in the event. Well, that's good. Otherwise, it would be a complete fail. <laughs> Advanced mode also brings with it one or more new optional objectives. This may be an objective to complete the missions in a set amount of time or some other goal that can be achieved. Failure to do these optional missions objectives will simply prevent you from getting the bonus rewards and will not result in failure of the mission. Successfully completing an advanced version of an event will reward you with even more marks than normal as well as dilithium ore. In addition, you will receive a package of advanced Q material with a chance of getting some of the highly sought after very rare materials. So advanced, formerly known as elite, actually gets a little bit more difficult now that some of the optionals are required. I would now actually recommend everybody play the normal versions first so that you can figure out what the objectives are. If you can get the objectives done in a normal one, it will help you in getting them done in the advanced one because at least you will know how to do them. Tactics are everything. Elite, the best of the best. So now there's a higher. Elite is no longer elite. Elite is like super elite. Warning. The new elite, it's got a warning. Now you know when a mode's got a warning on it. It's a good one. The new elite mode is far and away the hardest content we have ever put into Star Trek Online. We expect you to not just be outfit, outfitted in great gear, but have become proficient in the normal and advanced versions of the events as well. You should be a master of your character and your ship as well as knowing what your teammates are capable of doing. That's an important one. A lot of people in the SDFs or PVEs don't look at what their other teammates are doing. They, they're they only focused on what they're doing. They're not looking at what the other person is doing or how or if they need help or if, um, you know, they're doing something and you're like, oh, yeah, we need to go over there and do that with him and help him. You know, people aren't looking at what the other person are doing to know what they need to be doing. They're only concentrated on themselves. So this elite one, you need to know what your teammates are, are doing in the STF 
so that you can say, okay, they're doing that. I'm going to go over here and do this. Or they're doing that. They need my help with this right now. I'm going to go do that for them. You know, you need to know what your other teammates are doing. So that's an important part. I would I would bold that if I were cryptic because that is a really important part in the, these hard STFs. And apparently Elite's going to be even harder. You should also know what to expect from the enemy you will be fighting as well. If you see an Elite mode on a queued event after Delta Rising is launched, you should know that this is not for the faint of heart. These queues are designed to test our best and most powerful captains in the game. Players have yearned for a challenge, and this is it. Thank you, Cryptic. Enemies on Elite will hit significantly harder and be harder to kill, and at the same time, the missions themselves will take clockwork precision to complete. So, you you will not want to pug this. <laughs> You need to be level 60 before you can even attempt an Elite Mode queue event. You will also want some top-end gear, and for space, the best possible ship. So, I'm, I'm thinking here, they're, they're thinking Tier 6 ships. Mission objectives that were optional in Advanced Mode are now required. Ooh. This means failure to abide by those timers or other mission parameters will mean a premature end to your experience. So, just complete failure. In addition, if all the captains are dead or their ships destroyed at the same time the event automatically fails now that now they are really making it difficult so if everybody dies at the same time in your ship or ground you fail a mission holy crap that's new that is tough if that wasn't enough challenge for you there is now another new optional objective to complete for a bonus reward Success in an elite mode event means you will earn for yourself more marks, more dilithium ore, and an elite Q R&D material reward package for the research and development system. This has an even greater chance of getting you those very rare materials. And in addition to that, you'll receive a material reward for creating a superior upgrade for the upgrade system we talked about in an earlier blog. Many players have been asking for a challenge level beyond what we have given them in the past. The new elite mode is a response to that. This is not a mode we expect all players to be able to eventually complete. This is a mode that will result in many failed attempts before a successful strategy is struck upon, and even then, that strategy should take practice and precision to pull off on a continual basis. Not every event is getting an elite mode version of the la uh, for the launch, but at least one for each mark type is scheduled to be upgraded before then. Wee-ow. That is going to be crazy. The difficulty slider, in addition to advanced and elite modes getting changed for the queued events, the difficulty slider will be seeing a similar alteration. In advanced and elite difficulties, enemies will have more HP and more shields, so some of the older strategies of just use area of effect powers won't be as effective in the higher difficulties. You'll want to choose your targets more intelligently and take down the highest threats <clears throat> one at a time. Upping your difficulty in the game has always come with increased rewards in terms of XP and expertise, as well as increased drop rates on items. You'll enjoy a much better chance of rare blue and very rare purple gear items. With Delta Rising and the new changes to the difficulty slider, we will be increasing these even more, giving you even greater chances at higher quality loot drops than before. In conclusion, we are uh, proud to offer you these upgrades to the cute events and the difficulty sliders. With Delta Rising, we are taking the game to a whole new level, literally, and we wanted to make sure that the challenge for these new heights and appropriate are what you've been asking for for years. Wow. Um, a lot of stuff here to go over. Thank you for everybody who has uh, listened to this entire uh, read of mine. I see now it's been over an hour. Um, very long video. A lot of lot to go over here, but there, this, is, this is all good information. And this is really proving to me that um, this is a big upgrade for Star Trek Online. This really is an expansion. I mean, so much of the game is changing. I guess it does make sense as an expansion. I wouldn't have said that before, but now seeing how much is, com has, is coming, and even more to come probably that we haven't heard about yet, um, this is definitely an expansion. I still think the Delta Rising pack, where you get all the gear and everything, the, the whole pack, is too expensive. Uh, people were discussing what the prices should be, and uh, I think it should actually, yeah, it should be more like seventy nine ninety nine instead of what it is now. It needs to be, I said ninety nine before, but I'm actually going down. I think the package should be seventy nine ninety nine. That's what I would want to pay for it. I wouldn't want to pay any more than 80 bucks for it. Um, but anyway, um, that's what we got. So we got this new Cabal Adventure Zone. We got um, 
Delta Alliance reputation, whole reputation to grind, uh, a whole new gear upgrade system, which is, I don't even know how that's going to work out yet. Got Neelix, got uh, a new Voyager design, so people flying Voyagers uh, are going to be very popular for a little while. Uh, the Dauntless is coming. We've got a whole Q revamp. We've got this new Elite mode, which is just going to be insane. Um, and we have some reasoning behind the design of the ship. Other updates as far as uh, what new aliens were coming. I know one of those things was telling us about new aliens. I don't know where that one is. But um, I guess they haven't said anything about that yet or any more about that. No, they haven't. There's still more to come, but they haven't talked about them yet. Okay, so, wow, everybody. That's a lot. That is a lot. Well, I hope you all um, enjoyed that. Hmm. Yeah, there's the operations. Part. Okay, so, no, that's the, that's the, that's the um, wrong pack. There we go. Yeah, it's still one twenty four ninety nine, way overpriced. Well, anyways, thank you all for watching. Let me know what you think about my comments or about the new information uh, here coming to Star Trek Online, um, the new ships, the design of the new ships, uh, the new Delta uh, reputation system, uh, the new cute events, uh, this new normal, advanced, and elite STFs coming. Um, the new upgrade system for gear. Uh, a lot of information there. So uh, let me know what you think. Uh, all this good, all this bad. Could they do things differently? Make changes? Or everyone looking forward to this? Just give me your thoughts. I want to know. You know, if you're uh, now that you know what all is coming. You know, a lot here is coming. Are you really excited about this? Are you looking forward to some of this, or some of this you're not looking forward to? Um, let me know. Thank you for watching. Stay tuned for the next one.